Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fifth and final session of Limitless 2022. For Children, For Change, For Life, World Vision's Asia Summit for Corporate Good. This session is entitled The Great Resignation, Volunteerism and Reengagement. We have an illustrious panel joining us. The Great Resignation or the Big Shift has been an economic trend since early 2021. We've seen employees voluntarily resign from their jobs en masse due to various factors. As we become more socially conscious, corporate volunteering is becoming more and more popular. Join us in this session with our panel of experts as we discover how we can re-engage our employees and help them find purpose, relevance, and fulfillment in their everyday work. Please turn your attention to the screen as you see this video. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Mr. Srikanth, is unable to join us today, but we are fortunate to be joined by our esteemed panel, starting with Abhishek. Abhishek Humbad is the founder and CEO of Kudera, the world's leading volunteering management company, enabling 7 million employees to volunteer in 100 plus countries globally. Featured in the Forbes 30 under 30 list and the MIT Innovators list under 35, Abhishek is a leading voice in the evolution of responsible and sustainable businesses. Abhishek holds a bachelor's in engineering from Bits Bilani and an MBA from IIM Bangalore. We also have on this panel, Michael Sandiego, the chief finance officer of the Eon Group. Mike Sandiego used to be a World Vision scholar under the Ebenezer project of the Evangelical Church from 1984 to 87. He is an active ambassador and has been promoting the advocacy of World Vision and has been sponsoring kids since 2022. Mike was Senior Vice President for Finance and Management Services and is also now the CFO for EON from 2017 to 2013. And he has returned in 2022 to the EON Group as the Chief Financial Officer. We are also happy to have Carlos, uh, the Brand Marketing and Culture Director from Telus International for Asia Pacific Region. Thank you, Carlos, for joining in the middle of the night from Mexico. Carlos has worked for over 13 years in different locations of Telus International, supporting talent acquisition, communications, corporate social responsibility, marketing, and culture. Prior to joining Telus International, he has previous experience in other big BPO and captive centers. We are honored to have Rebecca Franz who is moderating this relevant, timely, and insightful conversation. Rebecca is the Regional Director of People and Culture for World Vision International in Asia Pacific, responsible for end-to-end -end HR across the region with a primary focus on people strategy, leadership, culture, organizational structure, staffing, performance, talent management, and employee experience. Rebecca has 28 years of work experience, accumulated through living and working in six countries, five industries, and three functions. 
Rebecca's vision is for every human being to have fulfilling works and make the unique contributions only they can on this planet. Thank you, Rebecca, for taking the time and over to you. Thank you so much, Rahul, and a warm welcome to our virtual audience here and all our panel. As a backdrop to this great resignation, I thought we could warm up our minds and our hearts, reflecting on three mega trends that have been confronting the workplace in recent times. The first is really about the erosion of trust. You know, some of us who have 28 years of work experience uh, know that the workplace today looks very different from how it looked back when we started. We've come a long way from lifetime employment Organizations are being driven so hard by shareholder demands for competitiveness, for compliance, for profitability, for efficiency. And we're moving away from those family founded, uh, founder led companies to really this generation of professionals that are caught between so many competing commitments. The millennial generation, one that we have two uh, wonderful speakers uh, on the panel today qualified to speak about. Uh, and Mike and I are the non-millennials here, just for uh, everybody's information. But we'll be getting into that a little bit. Those born between 1980 and 2000, they're now firmly entrenched as a majority in the workplace and will make up about 75% of our workforce by 2025. And you know, they're pushing us, they're, they're driving the workplace into this beautiful new future. And they're sort of saying, it's not enough to have profit, we must have purpose. It's not enough to make a contribution, we must have a community. They're forcing us to think about respecting the whole self and you know, busting this myth of nine to five working. And they are hungry for learning, for growth and reinvention. And for many of us, this is a challenge. How do we engage their hearts and minds? And then the last mega trend, I think, needs no introduction. We've all been living it for the last couple of years, the pandemic uh, and all the restrictions and challenges, but also all the opportunities and reinvention that we've seen with that. So I don't want to spend more time setting the stage because there are some fabulous conversations waiting to be had. We're looking to you to keep us uh, awake and engaged through your chat comments and questions, and we'll be taking that later as well. But for now, I'd just love to jump into these three mega trends and um, have our wonderful panel look into where does corporate volunteering fit in? Because each of these trends has shifted the game and the whole definition of a successful, sustainable organization uh, today and going forward is so different. And where does corporate volunteering offer hope uh, for us against that backdrop? And how can we make the most of it and watch out for some of the pitfalls? So let's start with you, Abhishek. I want you to really know that your CV reads like my dream CV, which I never had. You know, uh, your educational background, your credentials, and I kind of think, yet you've chosen a real off the beaten track path to leave a legacy. Tell us more about how Gudira came to be uh, and share a little bit more about yourself as we kick off. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rebecca. And it's, it's great to be here on this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, thank you so much for giving Gudera and me the opportunity. Uh, you know, Gudera, our, our mission essentially is that, uh, you know, we feel that everyone wants to volunteer, but it's just so difficult to do it. Uh, and we live in a world where, you know, it's it's so easy to book a cab or get a pizza delivered home, but it's just so difficult to volunteer. And that's just not right. Uh, you know, it, it takes a huge amount of effort to figure out the right kind of volunteering opportunity and have the right kind of volunteering experience for employees. And, and that's what we wanted to solve through technology. Uh, you know, we are a technology driven startup in some way. So, uh, you know, our, our mission from a social impact perspective is to enable the world to volunteer, but using really, really high class technology. Uh, in fact, uh, most of our team uh, at Godera, we have about 250 odd folks. Uh, and most of our team have similar educational backgrounds like me and, you know, really grateful uh, to our team for making this happen because 
you know we are really very passionate to make this work and make make you know volunteering super simple for everyone to do it and when i say super simple it means that uh, all the logistics around that has to be removed so that you could you know volunteer very very easily and and that actually uh, we feel volunteering is probably become a lot more mainstream as part of culture uh, for company so you know where it was a good to have probably a couple of years back uh, from a millennial and a gen z perspective it's almost a must have and this transition from a good to have to must have got accelerated because of the pandemic and and the side effects of that uh, and and one of the key side effects you know as you mentioned was the was the erosion of trust uh, which happened between the company their employees uh, and the community and and volunteering is is almost like a glue which can potentially connect uh, you know these key stakeholders together and and build or rebuild that trust uh, in a more meaningful manner uh, and happy to share in more details but just wanted to you know kick start in terms of you know where we feel you know volunteering is playing a role and you know godera trying to use or leverage technology like in so many other industries to you know disrupt or make volunteering significantly better and more accessible to everyone who wants to do it i love that make volunteering as easy as ordering pizza and carlos as a millennial you're probably very familiar with ordering pizza uh and sitting in your hotel room in mexico love to hear your views on the mega trend of millennials uh and how you see that and i'm sure you're going to set me right that millennials may not be the ones driving the philosophy in the workplace and you've been sharing a little bit with me backstage about gen z but let me leave it to you uh how do you see volunteering and the mega trend of millennials thanks rebecca so uh, one of the main points that i would like to place here straight ahead is um how we need to debunk the myth that the millennials are this careless fragile generation very unstable that don't spend too much time in in the same company um i think we need to understand that um we have impacted so much the way that business are done um not only because um we have come and disrupted um workplaces we have made sure that as avishek was mentioning now corporate social responsibility is almost our requirement in every company um but we have evolved right people think of millennials as this super young uh, people uh, but i'm 37 people who were born in the 80s is already 42 and they're still millennials um our objectives have changed and the way that we perceive millennials in the early 2000s it's not the way that we should perceive the generation now um we are in tells international 87% of our team members are currently millennials so we have jumped ahead of a trend of a 2025 that you were mentioning and um we have seen how attrition's pretty low um obviously the great resignation is affecting everyone across the board but we have sustained pretty healthy numbers of attrition in in our pipeline and it's because 87% of the people cares more about their work cares more about the environment in which they work and making sure that there's a lot of small things around flexibility diversity and corporate social responsibility that are maintained that are valuable for them that makes the decision for them to stay or to leave uh makes it a little harder to leave so good i love that the generation that's bringing caring community and conscience to our corporate culture uh and so agree with you from my experience but mike let's hear from you a little bit uh as the cfo of eon um yeah i think um i'm not sure whether i would classify the great resignation as another um type of pandemic that we that most organization are experiencing right now but uh really uh i've seen a lot of uh resignation and i mean good for carlos and their company that the attrition number is really being managed right now but in most organization uh a lot 
of uh, this organization are experiencing the so-called great resignation and probably because of what we have uh, experienced during the COVID pandemic that most of our employees, even if they are doing a work from home uh, arrangement, work from home uh, meaning they are less engaged probably. So I think it's time for us to counter the great resignation or this issue by making sure that we can re-engage the, the employees. In the past, we were taught, uh, I mean, the not so millennials like us, Rebecca, right? In the past, we were taught that we have to achieve productivity, enable for us to say that we have achieved successful management. Right now, uh, we can still achieve productivity, meaning efficiency and effectiveness, but we have to make sure that in the first place, our, the members of our organization are engaged and continuously re-engaged, meaning they are motivated, we, we listen to them, we hear them, and we address their concerns, especially the, the millennials' concerns, right? So um, I think it's just a matter of uh, making sure that we have laid out all the, the engagement, employee engagement, that uh, this is not an HR functions anymore. This is a shared uh, functions by, uh, by the members of the management, including the, the whole management committee. Again, it's no longer an HR role anymore. It's everyone's role to make sure that the members of the organization will be re-engaged and will be happy to, you know, to, to come back because uh, that's another challenge that uh, we will be experiencing. They have um, experienced the 100% work from home, and now we would like to introduce a hybrid setup, meaning work from home probably uh, three days in a week and then another two days work on site to make sure that we can still um, listen to them effectively and address their concern, do some collaborations and what have you. And, and also, uh, volunteerism is, uh, I agree, an effective uh, way to re-engage our people, especially the millennials, because they can they can feel that there's a balance between profit and purpose by doing this volunteerism act uh, for the chosen organization. I remember, no, allow me, I, I just remember in the past we've been, you know, uh, as a company in Aeon, we've been uh, doing several engagement, uh, like uh, we partner with Hands On Manila. Hands On Manila partner with Habitat for some uh, building houses. And then we do some coastal cleanup. We also did um, uh, a reading uh, in, in the Museo Pambata or Children's Museum, just like what Carlos is doing in Telus. And uh, we also uh, tried to introduce another uh, volunteerism uh, with Kite uh, Foundation. As a matter of fact, no, I would like to share with you guys that during the pandemic, some of our creative people were able to come up with a book, with a storybook that will be used to read to the children with uh, cancer in Kai. And um, another, uh, another uh, engagement that I can still remember is the uh, introduction of World Vision Sponsorship in our organization. That was uh, 12 years ago. And uh, being one of the uh, previously sponsored child, um, you know, the corporate development and HR used me to, to, to talk to our or to engage to our millennials so they would really understand where World Vision is coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And I love that call to action. Engaging our workforce is not an HR responsibility. It's across 
all of us to create that mm. sense of community and that stickiness in our workplaces. And Carlos, let's turn it to you to tell us a little bit about what's so special about volunteering. I mean, there's a ton of things we can do to engage our employees from providing breakfast on site before the pandemic to, you know, movie nights. And I've heard of all kinds of exciting uh, ways organizations are competing to be sticky. What's your thought on how volunteerism stands out in that space of options for engagement and how do your people respond? So one of the things that we have figured out, obviously after a lot of time of putting together um, activities for team members to volunteer is there's a direct correlation between volunteers and um, let's call it loyalty or the possibility of you leaving, um, we have found a very strong connection. And regularly, the programs that have a higher percentage of volunteering have a fewer percentage of attrition. Um, when we do or service on a yearly basis, um, one of the questions is if um, our team members consider that Dallas International creates an impact in that community. And over the past, uh, let's call it five years, um, that question has been consistently over 90% in, in positive response. So our team members really believe that we create an impact in the community. And when you compare the numbers of volunteers, our goal has always been in between 40 and 60% engaged volunteers within our organization. Mm -hmm. And in a 20,000 team member organization, that's a very high number. Um, so it's very interesting how even 60% of our team members are volunteers because we regularly reach our goal. 90 to 95% of them think that we create an impact in the community. So even those who don't volunteer are highly influenced by those who volunteer. So the effect that you create as a volunteer is sort of a ripple effect uh, that ends up affecting the way that you perceive the company Therefore, making it harder for you to be because you think you're in a good company. That's making an impact to the community. So it's really interesting how making sure that you have a strong, steady program for corporate social responsibility impacts your numbers. Um, and I think there's a lot of conversations that we need to have. But one of the most important topics is making sure that your corporate social responsibility programs obey to objectives that are bigger than what your company think um, and, and making sure that everything is tied to something that's relevant for the country. So it can be as easy as in the Philippines, for example, I know that there's a government plan for development towards 2030 that has 15 different objectives. We try to tie all of our activities, even if they're minimal, even if they're telling stories to children, like Michael was telling us, making sure that people know that literacy is one of the objectives for the Philippines towards 2030. And it's also a UN objective for development. So it's making sure that they understand that even the small actions have higher impact that contributes to the development of their country and even to the UN objectives for development. So making sure that the impact that they're making as volunteers um, have the higher reach and, and for them to see it, I think it's incredibly valid. It gives you the feeling of contribution and, and that's very fulfilling for all of our team members. You make such a good point around contribution because I think sometimes even in HR, um, I see us falling into this pitfall of linking everything to compensation and the data tells us something completely different. You know, the key to stickiness, loyalty, engagement is really not in compensation. That's more a hygiene factor. But it's this sense of being part of something bigger than ourselves. How has the pandemic and having people stuck at home, not being able to get out into communities, <laughs> affected uh, TELUS's volunteering efforts? I, it made me laugh a bit. Honestly, I, I have a fantastic team that... Um, switched pretty quickly during the pandemic. I was impressed on how everything changed so fast. I was overwhelmed, but my team quickly reacted. We started putting together 
opportunities for you not only to volunteer yourself but to volunteer with your family since you were spending a lot of time with the with the family that you were living with or with your close circle that you were sharing your space at that time um so we created activities in which you don't need it to be in the same space with somebody it could be translating a book from um tagalog to english or from english to tagalog or um recording science classes so you would have to create like a quick five minutes video in which you would do a lesson of science for kids that weren't able to go to school um or we also did uh storytelling for for kids who were not able to go to school and they were able to spend time with volunteers at least online and whether or not one of the objectives that I think we collaborate towards is parents did not know what to do with their kids the whole day during the pandemic. So even having them, having a volunteer reading to them during half an hour was such a relief for the parent and such a joyful experience for the kid um, mm-hmm. that it was important. So the I, I think it proved that you don't need a huge budget. You don't need a big activity. You don't need buses or lunches if you want your organization to create volunteer experiences it's completely possible and it doesn't require a lot of resources to make it happen well said and i think abhishek this is your cue i mean you have put together volunteering opportunities and people who have the heart for volunteering for so long now what are some of the challenges Um, that we face? I mean, it sounds like there's, you know, as many ideas and and possibilities for volunteering. How do you sort through all of that crowded space and choose a cause? What would your advice be? Yeah, and, and, you know, we we now have worked with a whole bunch of different companies, you know, enabling their employees to volunteer all across the globe. So right from an Apple to a Nike to an IBM, uh, enabling billions of employees globally to volunteer. Uh, I think uh, the best way is that you give the choice to the volunteer as to what they want to do rather than doing it just top down. It has to be a lot more, you know, bottom up and a, a lot more democratic. Uh, and we have seen now team managers taking the lead, uh, wanting their teams to go out and volunteer. So, uh, so be it, you know, team leaders, ERG members, chief of staff, EAs, HR managers, office managers, like a whole bunch of different stakeholders saying that, you know, what's the best way to engage my employees? Uh, and so there are two options. One is, you know, what they might call it meaningless and meaningful, right? There are two kinds of engagement potentially you could do. And, and you know, the some of the typical HR engagement uh, activities have become like fodder for stand-up comics that, you know, this is what HR gets us to do and thinks it's engagement, but, you know, it's just a potential waste of time and a tick mark exercise, but I have to do because I'm an intern. So just show my enthusiasm towards it, but I just don't care. Right. Uh, So that's, you know, one sort of engagement versus something which is significantly more meaningful where, you know, what you do as a group actually leads to some output, which is helpful for someone else. And that makes that engagement significantly more fulfilling and satisfying and builds that, you know, connection and bond and empathy uh, amongst hybrid distributed teams, which is like really, really shaken right now uh, with with hybrid workforce and employees shifting from one company to another every two years. Uh, How do you build that trust? Uh, How do you have an environment where employees are uh, not taking up hearts of a CEO and an intern, but all of them together for a cause. Uh, and that makes it a, a much more vulnerable and envo- much more vulnerable conversation so that employees are much more freer when they volunteer and you know pour their heart out on on different topics. So you're volunteering for you know STEM education, volunteering for racial equality, volunteering for pride, like for different causes. Um, you tend to share personal stories. Uh, and when that happens, that actually leads to a, a much, much stronger, deeper connection. It's it's almost intentional connection building uh, uh, through being more honest and vulnerable amongst each other as a group. And that leads to a, a really, uh, you know, great sort of, uh, uh, you know, bond between teams. Uh, and when they are distributed, they haven't seen each other for months or have never met each other. And still they build a connection on topics other than work 
uh, which are really important and and you know across the last two years you've seen companies focus on you know something called as ergs employee resource groups which are getting formed in a lot of companies so communities within companies focused on let's say uh, you know racial equality or uh, women networks or accessibility dni networks and these communities uh, are formed but they need some sort of engagement to hold that community together and volunteering becomes like a really powerful way of uh, not only holding it but helping them further the cause and building empathy around it uh, from a volunteering lens and and it's just not about you know doing something for others so volunteering is just not about helping the community but actually making employees much more empathetic better citizens uh, which is also helpful for the company over the long term helps in employer branding and a whole bunch of others so uh, and and most of the volunteers uh, especially millennials would be our instagram volunteers in some way so you know it's it's just not about okay i'm giving back after i reach 60 but i want to do it you know uh, from my early days but also uh go on instagram and linkedin and talk about it and feel good about volunteering so it's also helping somewhere from a mental health perspective especially in these times where it's a really important topic so you feel much happier you know after volunteering there is a science behind it that it leads to you know oxytocin getting released it's a hormone which you know gets you and makes you happy so so whole bunch of benefits out there but uh, you know companies need to think of volunteering as as i mentioned a must have and whenever it's must have it needs to be more structured uh, more planned uh, using technology like it has to be not as a good to have where it happens organically but companies need to be more intentional uh, and and a lot of our customers you know take up targets so let's say apple you know tim cook is the one taking up volunteering targets so it starts with the ceo saying that oh this is something which is important for the company and we'll we'll do that and and build like a plan around actually making this happen uh, also a lot of companies get into this notion that volunteering is you know one week a year we have a week of service and that's it uh, and that's that's not what employees want and they want that week but they want to do something throughout the year for the causes that they care about with their families with their friends with their colleagues so uh, just empowering them uh, to do it very seamlessly becomes a, a really critical exercise so good I mean, I'm just reflecting on some of the key takeaways from what you've just said. One, you know, watch out for doing a top-down exercise and forcing everybody to get passionate about animal shelters, for example, because that might not be everyone's cup of tea. And really allowing this to kind of bubble up uh, from the employees themselves, which mm-hmm. keeps that authenticity. But I think you then quickly move to this connection between when we are our authentic selves, we are able to connect, whether it's virtually. or physically just much better with people so finding that affinity creating those affinity groups and really discovering the way we care about the same causes creates that glue and that and that stickiness in workplaces i guess one thing that's puzzling me is you know you you talked about yes it it cannot be top down at the same time if we just allow everybody to you know follow their own heart we might end up diluting you know what possibilities there are for an organization to be that force for good so how do you advise corporates to make that choice should they come up with their own ideas and efforts and and you know initiatives or is it better to scope the market and put your shoulder to a credible wheel and what are some of the pitfalls and the dangers in in volunteering you know with all our good intentions are there any uh, landmines to watch out for Sure, I think uh, it it starts with uh, the role of the organization is to provide the enabling ecosystem for employees to volunteer. And when I say ecosystem, it, it's about the policy. So if you have a paid time off or you know any of those kind of policies, how do you recognize volunteers? How do you incentivize volunteers? So that's a policy lever. Second is just strategic lever, saying that you know for a lot of our customers, they are volunteering as part of new employee onboarding. so whenever an employee joins in every month you know all new employees who joined in volunteer as a group uh, and that creates a cohort which stays connected forever uh, so how do you you know make volunteering more mainstream so that's another lever third is about communications as to how do you drive communications internally about it there is so much of internal comms out there on so many different initiatives uh, what's priority for you from a volunteering perspective uh, tools and technologies that you bring in uh so these are things which are enabling uh, ecosystem from a volunteering perspective but you can't be prescriptive on how and where to volunteer uh but you could provide the guardrails and the framework 
and yeah. and for sure companies are not the experts so you know they are not the ones who need to do this but they need to provide this enabling infrastructure in terms of uh, the resources and investments needed to do that but it is a hugely high roi investment uh, you know once you provide this you know volunteering is probably the most cost effective employee engagement as well purely from a roi perspective uh, so so those are the things which companies need to do uh, in terms of pitfalls um, i think one common pitfall is that uh, companies feel that non profits need xyz whereas they don't need and they're forced to accept volunteers which you know for taking or getting some grants and i think that is counterproductive to the whole notion of uh, doing something which is meaningful uh, so uh, i think that is really important uh, second is just to understand volunteer personas uh, so you know if there are 100 members in a company there are two or three uh, folks who are extremely passionate about volunteering who were there in the hospitals during covid to help people out and there are 30 employees who just don't care about volunteering but there are this 16 in between who would do it if you make it super simple for them uh, so it's volunteering is almost like a funnel where top of the funnel is you know simple to do volunteering activities get a lot of people involved and make it part of culture and then a certain percentage of them would do more longer term skill space volunteering uh, as well so so think of it almost uh, more strategically rather than a bit more ad hoc uh, on how to create like a very robust you know volunteering uh, program um so, so these are some helpful. of the yeah sorry go No no thank you I was just saying it's so helpful and Mike you and I were talking about this earlier you know there's this sense of do gooding which is just going out and helping someone and then there's that slightly more strategic view on impact and long term impact and sustainable transformation and you know when we've got all this energy around volunteering how can we channel that to make sure that we're not just painting fences but actually changing the future And Mike, I want to put the spotlight on you. I know this could be a little uncomfortable, but as a sponsored child yourself, you know, I mean, you are telling in your life story the story of transformational development and how different that is from just charity work. Um, and and you describe it in this kind of you know partnership uh, of the beneficiary uh, and and uh, you know the the folks doing the volunteering so tell us more about that and love to give you a little time to unpack perspectives uh yeah thank you uh before i answer that i just would like to uh follow up on what uh abhishek has mentioned that uh any effort on volunteering should not be a push coming from the top it should be uh, agreed uh, among the employees or among the the members of the organization that we want to do this not because we want to comply on our balance scorecard and show to the other uh, companies or organization that we are achieving all the high marks in our balance scorecard and hitting that uh, corporate social responsibility points as well so uh, it must be really um, um an effort that will be you know discussed together with your employees so the true sense of volunteerism will be there uh that's uh, that's what happened when uh, our corporate uh corporate affairs staff uh, approached me uh, about the inquiry from world vision philippines when they want to partner with us and they would like to engage our employees and introduce the sponsorship program of world vision philippines and then uh, i told her uh, uh anna you know i used to be a world vision uh child and she was really surprised she couldn't believe it she thought she thought i was just joking and um really at that time uh looking at at her cfo she couldn't believe that she was that he was once or i was once a world vision as a sponsor child so anyway uh i told her that okay uh, let's uh let's welcome world vision philippines and to make it more uh, uh, acceptable or engaging to our employees let's make it a salary deduction thing so employees wouldn't feel that you know it's hurting their pocket or it's being credited to their credit card uh, every month so let's make it a uh, you know a salary deduction uh, uh, they will really volunteer uh, 
spending probably at that time 600 now i think it's 750 pesos for a child so uh, we started the the introduction of world vision program by by announcing to the employees in a town hall meeting so it would appear that we're not cascading this or we're not imposing the program to them it's more of really consulting with them and then presenting that their very own cfo was once a beneficiary of world vision uh, program so um, anyway so i told them that uh i used to be a world vision kid and uh at that time uh, i was labeled I, will, I was labeled as a last chance kid because my sponsorship came in late normally uh world vision will sponsor the child from grade school up to high school but my program was uh the i mean the 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 counterpart in our in our church sponsored my allowance during my college days my mom approached the church saying that you know my my uh my boy is entering college and we don't have you know uh enough money to support him maybe you can consider him and then um luckily uh you know uh they agreed to sponsor me and they provided me monthly allowance at that time i used the allowance for my transport and to buy some secondhand books in the university area in manila so i could really so i could really transform or uh, change my mindset that i'm not just into this for charity i would like to take advantage of this opportunity so i can better myself by making sure that by improving the way I perform in school, I will be hitting two birds with one stone. Number one, I'll be, I'll be delivering good grades for World Vision Philippines, of course. And second, uh, I will, I, 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 make, I am making sure that I am enriching myself because I'm prioritizing my education. So because of that, because of that transformation in my younger mindset uh fortunately i graduated with an honor in college so that uh uh gave me a passport to be invited with different corporations immediately after graduation so fast forward um i was re-engaged with world vision when i entered uh the mba school in manila in one of our uh, elective uh, courses, the human resources manager of J&J uh, &J introduced World Vision in our class and saying that uh, maybe your company is not doing this, but you can do this on a personal level. Making CSR as your own PSR or personal social responsibility. Um, I did not think twice at the time. I stood up and then announced to the class that, you know, guys, I used to be a beneficiary of World Vision Philippines. So this project is legit. So please uh, let us try to uh, let us try to join the program, patronize the program that World Vision is promoting in our class. So the the, the the professor together with the speak with the invited speaker from J and J, we're happy to to note that I that I stood up and supported the concept of CSR slash PSR. That's what I also did when we talked to our employee during one, during our town hall meeting. What impacted uh what impacted me during the time was. When I heard one of our utility guy talking to our messenger, convincing the messenger that, you know, uh, Adrian, I cannot, uh, I cannot contribute the monthly 600 just on my own, but I would like to participate in this volunteerism. Can you share the 600 with me? And then let's contribute 300 a month or 150 pesos every payday. So fortunately for him, I was really smiling at the back hearing them discussing this. 
And then when we when he went home, this uh this utility guy, he announced to the family, even to his kids, that you know, guys, starting today, I will be sponsoring one child of World Vision. And then the daughter said, uh, Dad, how come you are sponsoring a child when we don't have so much money to spare? And then he said, you know, I was I was I was inspired by our CFO. He used to be a World Vision uh, sponsor child. So I want to make sure that I can develop another Mike and Jagu in this world, something like that. So the the daughter was was also inspired by uh, by his father's decision, and I just heard uh, after a couple of years that the daughter keeps on bringing medals, gold and silver medals from school. She performed better in school because uh, thinking that you know if my father is supporting uh, one child so she can go to school, why not make the best out of my schooling as well? So I was really proud of uh, you know this uh, engagement you know, that the company has initiated for our employees. We have achieved not only you know uh, we have not just participated with the World Vision Project. But it created a lot of positive impact to our employees. Mm -hmm. And up to now, I keep on, you know, uh, sharing these stories to the World Vision events that I'm being uh, invited to. Really, uh, it, it really melts my heart uh, hearing the stories again and again. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I think you had us all just, you know, uh, from from the get go on your on your personal story and really moving, and I think it just helps me also to reflect on you know we're talking about volunteerism as a corporate um, you know uh, a piece of the corporate strategy toolkit for engaging employees, but really the two things you highlight through your story is how it changes us as people to be doing this and the impact mm -hmm. that has on folks back at home and the folks that touch us, and I think the second thing is really that this can be the gift that keeps on giving because you talked about two things, but really what you probably don't see and we can see is how you're also paying it forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there is, there is uh, that multiplier effect uh, that can be created when you make smart choices around volunteering. I see that we've got a couple of really thought provoking questions uh, from, from the audience. And I would just love um, to uh, direct them maybe to, to each of you. Abhishek, this one from Gerald Harding um, says, how can large INGOs like World Vision who have grassroots presence come up with volunteering opportunities and how will that contribute to the INGO strategic goals? And I, I think it's so much nicer to have that answer from an outside in perspective than from a World Vision perspective. Uh, but I know that a little later, um, Chris uh, Devarakam is going to come and answer exactly that question for you, Gerald. But uh, just so we don't miss this opportunity to get some wisdom from you, Carlos, in a couple of minutes, could you comment on Gerald's question? Uh, it's for me. So I don't have. Oh, sorry. Good. Yes, I think it's going to be you, Abhishek. <laughs> Got it. So just, just on that question on international uh, NGOs, I think uh, the corporate side question is exactly the opposite that, you know, we have lots of employees who want to volunteer and where do we find, you know, the really good uh, volunteering opportunities and, and, and similarly at the nonprofit side uh, and, and happy for Godera to step in as in, you know, we work with thousands of uh, nonprofits and international nonprofits are uh, something that we'd love to partner with. Uh, we work with a lot of UN agencies and a whole bunch of others. So, uh, and we have a separate team that helps nonprofits create or co-create the right kind of volunteering opportunities that is uh, right from a corporate perspective, but also beneficial from a nonprofit and an end beneficiary perspective. So, so this is something which has to be done. And happy to uh, work on that uh, with with you. Uh, and and maybe you could. Uh, touch base offline on that. Yeah, thank you. And maybe we can take Jane's question next. Um, around the panelists on a scale of zero to five, uh, how do you think each of you 
has done and what could you do differently? Uh, why don't we start with you this time, Carlos? Yeah, perfect. I'm, so I'm obviously incredibly biased around TELUS and I would love to say we're like a five out of five, um, but engagement is such an ever-changing topic. To be honest, um, you can be 100% engaged with your company today, but tomorrow you can receive a job offer from a company that you always wish to work with, an amazing compensation package that fulfills everything. And even though you were 100% engaged yesterday, today that you got the offer, you might not be 100% engaged. So I would like to say we're somehow a three um, because we put a lot of effort on a daily basis, but we're very well aware that there's going to be people and unfortunately it's going to find greener pastures outside and there's nothing that we can do. Um, in, in fact, we try to be incredibly thankful for the time that team members spent with us, what they have been able to learn and, and what they have been able to share with us. Uh, but we understand there's a path and we all have professional aspirations uh, that sometimes cannot be fulfilled where you're working. Um, nevertheless, for all of those who are staying, we try to keep them happy. Um, we have a tagline that we try to apply into everything, thinking on our team members' happiness level. And, and we always say we're happy here. Um, and that's kind of core mentality whenever we try to put together an engagement situation. We try to measure um, how, how can we be better on a daily basis, but situation is, again, ever-changing. And right now with the Great Resignation, everybody's getting impacted because of so many reasons that it's, I think, impossible to be that high. So I would say a three, and I would say the first thing that you need to do is to listen. Um, make sure that you have a very thorough system of exit interviews. Get all the feedback from all the people that's leaving and make sure that then after you have like a good amount of data uh, that you can compile and analyze, you put together a plan to tackle those things that people's pointing out when they're leaving because um, that's such an interesting level of insights and, and plans can continue through. And then you need to also compare with those who are staying uh, with your annual, menstrual, whatever monthly surveys that you're having. Um, that's, that's, I think, good amounts of data that you can analyze and put together plans for us. Thank you, Carlos. I'm actually going to skip forward, Jane, if that's okay, and, and give you a chance to maybe connect with Abhishek and Michael offline, because there is another really interesting question about selection of volunteering opportunities. And I'll open that up for the panel. You know, it's back to this question of how can we be strategic? And I will ask that we try to address that in just a couple of minutes or under so that we have a few minutes left just to wrap us up nicely. Abhishek, do you want to jump in on this one? Sure. Uh, and I would say that uh, so volunteering, essentially, one is simple to do and one is, let's say, skills based volunteering. Uh, and typically, in skills based volunteering, you'd want to uh, leverage the expertise of certain functions. Let's say to your marketing team, your finance team, your tech team. And there, if it's aligned to your uh, skills, then you should take it up. But in general, the philosophy is it's it's more community first and more employee first. Uh, I think a lot of your CSR programs can be strategic in nature, uh, wherein you add value beyond cash, but a lot of volunteering is more about your employees and people, which is uh, should be more community and people first. And that was a beautiful comment about that too, you know, uh, not getting it mixed up between uh, CSR, philanthropy, and volunteering as a as a tool for engagement and, and as a channel, I guess, for our employees to feel more engaged in their communities. I'm going to ask each of you to give us your 60-second um, closing comment on this so uh, fascinating and engaging topic that I think we could be here for another hour. But let me just ask Michael in 60 seconds, uh, key takeaways and, and a summary for the session. And then we'll go to Carlos and Abhishek will let you bring us home. Um, again, I would like to uh, reiterate that uh, CSR should not be top down or uh, regarding this as a corporate objective. 
uh, it's a separate thing. Uh, once you engage your employee and make it part of their own, then it could be sustainable. Uh, uh, like what Carlos has mentioned, even if they left the company or leave the company, they will still be doing the same volunteering act after. So, um, like, uh, I mean, uh, not um, with all modesty, not just paying, uh, paying forward or uh, really being gratitude of what I have experienced under World Vision, but Every, almost every day, I would like, uh, you know, I would, or, or any opportunity, I would really take to, to post in my social media account about World Vision. Whenever I'm invited, I, I would really post about it in my, in all of my social media accounts, even LinkedIn. Um, and so I can encourage people to join the cause. Because it's not just about you know uh, giving opportunity to children, but also um, getting into the other costs that World Vision Philippines is advocating, uh, like when there's flood or when there's earthquake. I'm concerned. We, I'm sorry. I'm going to leave it there because we might not have time for uh, hearing Carlos and Abhishek's closing comments if I don't. Okay. So Carlos, over to you, and then Abhishek do bring us home. Yep. So I, I think it's important to say that the great resignation is here. It's unavoidable. We're all going to lose people. We need to focus on those who are staying. We need to make sure that we listen. We need to make sure that we have a strong plan. And we need to make sure that that strong plan includes opportunities for volunteerism, which is something that we have proven almost uh, that impacts directly the level of, of loyalty and willingness to stay of our team members. And, and just to add to what Carlos uh, mentioned, you know, uh, the future of work, as we know, is fundamentally transformed and volunteering is and will be mainstream in this future of work. So, you know, from a corporate perspective, uh, instead of being reactive to it, be proactive and have a structured volunteering program to offer to your employees. If you don't, they would figure out a way to do it. Uh, and it's much better you do it for them. Uh, and from a nonprofit perspective, again, this is a great way to engage uh, employees and companies. So also be proactive uh, from that perspective. So this is mainstream, will be mainstream and big. So make sure you are prepared for it. Thank you all. And uh, over to you, Rahul. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, the panel, for taking the time and speaking about the great resignation and how volunteerism can help in re-engagement. I think very good points of view, and it is not about a good to have anymore, but it is rather a must to have, must have. Um, we learn a lot and how you can make it more impactful and effective across the board by including even their families as well. Um, so thank you all for joining for this session. Um, and to learn more about how you could actually volunteer uh, with World Vision, I'd like to invite Chris Devrikam, Chief Operating Officer for World Vision in Asia Pacific, leading the strategic support services. Uh, Chris would give us a brief introduction into how you could actually volunteer uh, as part of World Vision from your corporate as well. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, panel, for a very powerful discussion. And uh, from CSR to ESR, that's, that's really great. And Mike, thanks for that uh, very touching story. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us uh, for Dinner Bliss, for children, for change, for life over the last two days, as Rebecca and the panel were discussing volunteers and uh, re-engagement. I was thinking of uh, what better way to volunteer time than to spend it with 10 people. World Vision in Asia Pacific 
works with uh, close to 4 million people between the ages of 12 to 18, peers across uh, 25,000 young people clubs. These young people clubs give you the opportunity to invest in your human capital while improving employee engagement. Corporate volunteering is not an aspiration for us at all. Let us watch this brief video on adopting a young people's club that will be transformative for employees and children. I have visited some of these clubs myself. Uh, adults at End People's Club, what your employees can do for your company is invaluable, and what they can do for children is immense. At this time, I would like to thank each one of you for joining us for Limitless World Vision's Asia Summit of Conflict. This is the first event of its kind for us at World Vision. I'll be virtual, and we are so glad that you've been part of it. We hope that you have gained some valuable insights from our various sessions. We've explored how the youth can potentially be instruments in achieving inclusive growth if we invest in programs that enhance their education, help them develop development skills, and involve them in the conversations and decision-making processes that affect them. Empowering the youth means regarding them as more than just beneficiaries for our programs, but capable partners and future leaders in sustainability. And as such, we must commit to authentic listening, collaboration, and co creation of solutions for our youth centered issues. And overall, businesses and corporations must create opportunities for youth in which to participate in order to succeed in their various industries. We have uh, agreed from our session on technology that while it can be an enabler of equitable education, we must focus on solutions for improving access, especially for students from the marginalized and underserved sectors to fully benefit. Further, we not only have to make technology more accessible by addressing issues, such as infrastructure, but we must also invest in programs that support the teachers and educators who are crucial in the delivery of quality education as well. We're also reminded in the session that like uh, many pursuits towards sustainability, we cannot do it alone. And as such, building partnerships with government, civil society, the academia, and the community are all welcome in ensuring education. We've learned about the various ways businesses have been helping the end hunger while creating sustainable systems. 
we've emphasized the urgency of addressing climate change and that businesses don't have to forego the bottom line when committing to climate action. And uh, we've learned the wide value of volunteerism, uh, the re-engaging employees in our corporations, but also as an effective source of support for communities. In sum, we hope that you've been inspired by the many examples of how businesses and corporations can play an important role in our world alongside government and civil society to achieve the sustainable development goals for all. We can only imagine what the involvement of businesses and corporations committed to sustainability would mean and what a significant difference it would make in the lives of men, women, and especially children. In these challenging times, we may all have been slowed down by the pandemic, by conflict, and by other obstacles. But we believe that together we can overcome these challenges and succeed. And my sincere thanks to Neville, our regional development director, for his support and all around coordination. Grateful as well to the limitless team, Michelle, Saeed, Gan. Peter, Pradeep, Jijef, and Rahul, who have been designed, who have designed, uh, resourced, and in significant this event in the last nine months. We would also like to place on the card our sister thanks to the advisory group made of uh, regional function directors and support of his colleagues, Larry, Ryan, uh, Venice, Winnie, and Billy, among others, who provided the valuable advice to one of this endeavor. And finally, this event would not have been possible without the coordinate support of Pam, AG, Cynthia, and the team from the Army. We praise and thank God Almighty for his wisdom, direction, and presence at every moment of this event. Once again, we thank you for joining the session. As we close, we invite you to stay and network in the lounge for the books. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for joining. As we conclude day two of the summit, we would like to thank you for taking the time to join us. And we thank all our partners who believe in the significance and impact of World Vision and continue to join us through this journey to lead sustainable change. We hope to see you all at the next Limitless for Children for Change for Life, World Vision's Asia Summit for Corporate Good. At this point, we are encouraging you to visit the lounge virtually roam and meet like-minded and like-hearted individuals attending today's sessions. Please also take time to visit the country booths and get to meet our lovely field office colleagues and the booth managers in those country booths as well. We'd like to hear your thoughts about the summit. Please answer a quick event feedback form, which will be shared on the chat box now. If you're posting about today's event, please tag us using hashtag limitless wvi 2022 thank you and happy networking see you all at the next limitless